Occupational English test. Practice test one. Listening test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract one. You hear an otolaryngologist talking to a patient named Terry Butler. For questions one to twelve, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at your notes. Good afternoon, Mr. Butler. Is it? Yes, Terry Butler. So your GP has referred you because of a problem you've been having with your nose. Can you tell me more about it, please? Well, it's usually when I first wake up, I get a terrible crusty mucus, but it tends to stay around for the whole day. It's been irritating me for a couple of months, actually. I initially thought it had just resolved by itself, but it hasn't. The thing is, and I know it's a bit disgusting, but Sometimes when I try to get it out, I've had a little bit of bleeding. It's not a lot by any means, but enough to notice. Right. Okay. I've also noticed, for example, when my wife puts on perfume, it's my sense of smell. I can't seem to detect it as strongly these days, so I'm a little concerned over that. I mean, I can still breathe, of course, but it's worrying. I actually thought I was allergic to something because we'd recently adopted two cats, or maybe it was I don't know, dust mites or the season, because I suddenly started sneezing. Not all day, but still quite often, regular sneezing. But that's not the case apparently. I know this condition isn't dire, but it does affect my life. The blocked-up feeling can really hurt sometimes. I'm sorry to hear it's caused you so much worry. Well, I'm also concerned about my job. I'm a hire car driver, and it's mostly for high-end clients, so it involves a certain degree of、uh, professionalism. The last thing I need is to be seen constantly playing with or twitching my nose, or worse still, sneeze and cause an accident. So you don't believe it's allergies related? Well, not as far as I know. I've been to my GP, as you know, and tried to rule things out. First, I had a skin prick test, and that didn't show anything. So I went away thinking it'd clear up. But then, after a few weeks, it was still annoying me. So I had a blood test, but that apparently came back clear. But I keep thinking maybe it's something less common, and that's why nothing's shown up. My GP asked if I'd been ill because he thought perhaps it was caused by a viral infection, but. I hadn't been. He also asked if I was taking any medications that he wasn't aware of, like beta blockers or antidepressants, which I wasn't. In fact, the only thing I'd started using around that time was a nasal decongestant spray that I'd bought from the chemist, which he then advised me to stop. He thought maybe I'd been using it too much, so I did, of course, but doing so didn't seem to make a difference. I see. And he suggested I try a few to see if they make a difference. So I got a humidifier that apparently helps with the dry air, and therefore. To loosen the mucus, which was okay, but didn't make too great of an impact. He told me how to make up a salt water solution. It's much cheaper than buying it from the chemist. I still use it now, and that helps a little too, but just not for long periods of time. So I have to keep it up a few times throughout the day. Before going to bed, he said I should take an antihistamine, but again, it just doesn't seem to last too long. And before I know it, I'm feeling the same as before taking it. And how's your health generally? I'm typically as fit as a fiddle. I quit smoking 14 years ago because of a number of recurring lung infections at the time. They were enough to make me wake up to myself and finally go cold turkey. As for alcohol, well, I've been having my regular nightcap of whiskey for 20 years. Always the same brand, and I always stop at two. 
As I said, I'm reasonably fit for my age. I go to the gym regularly. I've been involved in a cycling club for a number of years. We're a medium distance group and average around 60 kilometers an outing, so not too shabby. That's great. So, do you think there could be something wrong with my nose? Well, that's what we intend to find out. The way we do that is by performing a nasal endoscopy. It's a very thin and flexible tube. You hear a general practitioner talking to a patient named Jane Brown. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at your notes. Welcome, Miss Brown. May I call you Jane? Yes, of course. I understand you've just registered as a new patient with this practice. Yes, I've just recently moved to the area and my old doctor's a little too far to travel. No problem. And you've come here today because of some discomfort in your left arm. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Well, it's actually a pain along the bone on the outside edge of my forearm. It's kind of more numb than anything and sort of spreads to my little finger. It started about two weeks ago, I think, and comes and goes, but there's definitely something wrong there. It's getting quite painful, especially at night. It's even caused me to wake up a few times. And sometimes if I stretch out my arm suddenly or if I bend it with any force, the pain, uh, it's hard to describe, kind of like a guitar string being wound really tight. Okay, and have you tried anything for it? Well, I asked a few friends and they said it's probably a pinched nerve and to try just resting it on a pillow. So I did, but that didn't make a difference. So I looked it up online and it was recommended to put some ice on it and also a heat pack, alternating a warm compress with ice, kind of swap from one to the other and also see which one worked the best. It also said I can take anti-inflammatories, which I did for about a week, and it made very little difference. It also said I should do some gentle stretching exercises, but at the time they hurt to do, so I didn't really follow through with them. Right, and you're 22. Are you working or studying? I'm still at university. I'm doing a Bachelor of Science. It's my final year, so it's pretty hectic. I spend most of my days sitting at a computer. Okay, can you tell me more about that? How long you'd spend at the computer, I mean? Well, I'd sit there anywhere up to 10 hours or even more some days. It's pretty uncomfortable at home. We have a really large desk. It's one of those old antique things. My dad bought it at an auction. It's just that it's so high, so my forearms and I guess also my wrists have to lean against the edge of it when I type. Sometimes I sit there for a few hours and don't really move them very much. If I'm concentrating on my work, then I don't notice the kind of pressure I'm putting on them, but I often see that I have deep creases kind of halfway down my arms when I stand up, so I guess it might be quite a lot. Now that I'm saying this, it's pretty obvious that that might be the reason for the pain. Mm, I'd certainly say it's a contributing factor. Is that the same at university? Well, if it's a tutorial, then I sit the same way as at home because uh, the tables there are terrible and I'm so used to it. If it's a lecture, we have those little flip top tables so I can sit properly with my back straight because there's nothing to lean against and they're a comfortable height. Uh, I also have a question, if it's okay. Yes, of course. Would playing a lot of sport help this kind of injury or make it worse? Mm, it would depend on the type and the intensity. Well, I play netball on Tuesday nights, not for a competition, just a mixed group of friends. I also swim twice a week, uh, but about half a year ago, I joined the university rowing team. That's what makes me really feel it because of the action of my arms having to stretch and bend at the elbow so much. And that causes really intense pain. It's hard and you need to be fairly strong, but I enjoy it, so I want to keep at it if I can. That's another reason I'd really like to get this sorted out. I haven't played any sport for the last seven days because of the pain, but I really want to get back to it. It's kind of addictive. 
Mm, a break's a good idea. They sound rather rigorous. What I'd like to do now is examine not only your arm, but also your neck and spine. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a nurse talking to her colleague about a patient's request to leave the ward. Now read the question. Mr. Jenkins really shouldn't be going anywhere at the moment. Well, it's only to the coffee shop downstairs and he's mobile, so... He can certainly do minor things like showering and getting back and forth to the toilet by himself, but that doesn't necessarily mean he's up to leaving the ward. He's going a little stir crazy, and he's been in the ward now for weeks. He needs to feel like a normal person again. Of course he does, but we can't jeopardize his safety. I realize he believes he can, but I really think it's beyond his capability right now. I'm happy to go with him if it'll ease your mind. I'd really prefer if he just holds off until he gets the tick of approval. We don't want him undoing all the effort for a cup of coffee. You hear a paramedic briefing a doctor on a recent emergency admission. Now read the question. Mr. Teagan has suffered suspected second-degree burns from boiling oil to the back of both hands and forearms. He works as an apprentice chef and was lifting a pot of oil when he slipped, inadvertently scolding himself. Apparently he panicked and his co-workers were forced to hold his arms under cool running water until we arrived at the scene. They also managed to contact his wife, who's on her way. You may appreciate her assistance as he's very distressed and obviously frightened. My colleague has managed to administer oxygen and gave 2.5 milligrams of morphine, but that was as far as he got as Mr. Teagan continued to put up quite a struggle en route, which is something you'll need to consider before any further treatment. Pain is well controlled at present. You hear an anaesthetist talking with a patient prior to her surgery. Now read the question. So, Mrs. Simpson, do you have any questions before we go into the theatre? Uh, I'm sorry. I think I'm just a little nervous. Everything you told me earlier has gone in one ear and out the other. I see. It's perfectly normal to be anxious before major surgery. Well, if I'm going to be under for such a long time, it just worries me that anything could happen. I know there are dangers involved with it, and I think I'm prepared for that. But how will it leave me feeling? I, I mean, well, I'm really not looking forward to it. It's going to be a lot of rehab and really training myself to walk again. I'm just not sure if I'm up to the challenge. How can I possibly go through all of that when I'm in such agony? It just doesn't seem possible. It's such a long process. You hear a trainee doctor telling her supervisor about an uncomfortable situation she recently encountered with an end-of-life patient. Now read the question. Would you mind if we talk about Mr. Harris in bed six? Sure. Is there a problem? No, nothing like that. The ICU nurse asked me to talk with the patient's family about his situation. I mean, basically explain to them that there's nothing else we can really do for him and that he likely won't survive. How did it go? 
Horribly. They were asking what they should do next, what steps to take. I could barely keep myself together. It was just so hard to talk with them just staring at me like that, with such blank expressions. It was the hardest thing I've ever encountered. I honestly don't think I'm cut out for situations like that. I assure you, it's perfectly normal in such a predicament. You hear a nurse briefing a colleague at the end of her shift. Now read the question. So in bed five is Mr. Benjamin Higgins, 75 years of age under Dr. Munro. He had elective angioplasty and insertion of stent via the left femoral artery this morning at 9am. He has a history of hypertension, hypercholesterolemia and angina. His medications are metoprolol twice a day, simvastatin and glycerol trinitrate single spray. He has no known allergies. With regards to the operation, there were no complications and he returned to the ward today at 11.30am. Did he have any pain at all? He did, just 3 out of 10, mild discomfort. I tried to call Dr. Munro, but he was in theatre. But his secretary said she'll pass it on. He has to remain supine until 5pm today, and his wife will have to be informed of his progress. When I received him, he was alert and orientated, and his vitals were within normal range. ECG is normal sinus rhythm, and that was at 11.45. You hear a veterinarian and the owner of a cat discussing how to give insulin to her pet. Now read the question. So I'll just explain a little on the initial steps of administering the insulin. Okay. It's really very simple. So the first thing is the insulin needs to stay in the refrigerator. Now Felix is getting two units, twice per day. So what I suggest is marking it on a calendar for each day. So divide the day in half with a line. I'd recommend drawing a little box in each section so you can give it a big tick for both morning and evening doses. The one thing you don't want to do is double dose the insulin. So you turn the bottle upside down and roll it gently, don't shake it, and then take out a syringe. What happens if you shake it? I could potentially destroy it, so you want to try to avoid that. Okay, sure. You hear an interview with an optometrist called Henry Chapman who's talking about the impact of macular degeneration. You now have 90 seconds to read the questions.
We are talking today with Henry Chapman, an optometrist with a special interest in macular degeneration. Mr. Chapman, firstly, what is macular degeneration and how did your particular interest in this disease come about? Macular degeneration is actually the name given to a group of chronic degenerative retinal eye diseases that cause a distortion or progressive loss of a person's central vision but leaves the peripheral or side vision intact. Say, if someone with macular degeneration was facing me now, they'd see my arms and legs, the area around me, but my, my face would likely be obscured by a dark or empty space. They experience a dreadful sense of being disconnected or cut off from everyday life. As an optometrist for 30 years, I've had my share of cases and every new patient is like a spark because the impact of each accumulates over time to a kind of, oh, almost what you call a fixation, I guess. Even after all these years, however, I was still shocked to hear my sister had recently been diagnosed with macular degeneration and because of that, I've now also seen firsthand what this terrible disease does to the entire family. What's the most challenging part for those living with macular degeneration? Take a recent patient of mine called Robert. He was 55 when he first noticed the symptoms. Blurred vision, distortion of straight lines. The effect on his life was profound, and that's the tragedy of this disease. He was working as a driving instructor, then suddenly had to resign, but still with the financial burdens of daily life. His passion for carpentry, or even basic reading, fell by the wayside. Worst of all for Robert was no longer being able to see his grandchildren's faces clearly, which was obviously very upsetting. Unfortunately, he also experienced depression for a time. This may not happen to everyone, but it's certainly more common than people realise. What can be done for patients such as Robert? This is a disease that's typically related to ageing, which is the commonest risk factor, but it's certainly not a normal or inevitable consequence of getting old. So although older people are generally more accepting of the extra baggage that comes with ageing, it's still difficult for many to accept and discuss the changes associated with macular degeneration. There's a tragedy attached to any disease or illness, but vision loss also carries some major disruptions to a person's lifestyle, as well as mental hurdles, like few other diseases do. I feel that's something that can at times be neglected. There are support groups, but I'm talking on an optometrist level. My job is to help diagnose and treat a patient. But what of their additional struggles? That's where I'd like to place myself a little better and allow patients like Robert the freedom and availability to open up. And do patients ever volunteer to express their fears or frustrations to you directly? They do, but in the beginning what I see is their brave face. They often say, there's always someone worse off. And that's an admirable trait, but reality soon rears its ugly head. Because macular degeneration doesn't result in total blindness, sufferers are left with partial vision, and I suspect that many patients may genuinely interpret this as being somehow less significant than total blindness, like they don't have the right to speak out. The reality is, of course, that sufferers of macular degeneration have many of the same fears and impediments as those who've completely lost their sight, and yet they're worried about voicing this. So it's imperative that we not only actively listen, but also encourage and support them to openly share their stories. Can you give us an example of how you've changed the way you treat your own patients? Sure. I have a patient called Jennifer. She's 62 and has late-stage neovascular or wet macular degeneration. This is caused by the formation of very fragile blood vessels which leak fluid and blood within and under the retina. It also leads to a rapid loss of central vision, as opposed to the dry kind, which is a far slower decline. Therefore, it came as a great shock for Jennifer, in turn making her a perfect prototype, if you will, in trying something new. I allocated just an additional 10 minutes to each of her appointments and explained it was for an open discussion. This extra time gave me the opportunity to delve a little deeper into how she was coping with the rapid changes she was experiencing and gave her more freedom to discuss her concerns. The positive change in communication was extraordinary, so I adopted this for all my patients thereafter. So what, if anything, can be done to help prevent macular degeneration? Research is ongoing and advancements in treatment are being made daily, and this needs to continue. But you can't leave it up to researchers. I believe in what the individual can do. This means that any difficulty with vision should never be dismissed as part of ageing. 
In its early stages, macular degeneration may not result in noticeable visual symptoms, but it can be detected with an eye test. If people want to save their sight, I can't stress enough how crucial the early detection of any form of macular degeneration is. The sooner that this disease is detected, the earlier that steps can be taken to help slow its progression and save sight through treatment and necessary lifestyle modifications. Thank you for sharing. You hear a clinical dietitian called Rebecca Hudson giving a presentation to a group of healthcare providers. You now have 90 seconds to read the questions. My name's Rebecca Hudson, and I'm a clinical dietitian working here in the hospital. Today I'll be presenting what some consider a very challenging topic, raising the issue of weight loss and obesity with patients. A person's weight is a complex and sensitive issue. Many factors are at play, like concerns about being judged, feelings of embarrassment, or even failure. As a dietitian, I see this on a daily basis, yet beginning discussions about weight can still be unsettling for both myself and the patient who often knows it's coming. This is because, as healthcare providers, we're sometimes uncertain of how to discuss weight-related issues while still providing support to our patients in ways that are empowering and non-judgmental. During the consultation, we strive to get our message across, but if we lack the initial training to do so, chances are we'll lose trust and irrevocably damage the provider-patient relationship that's so vital. We risk stigmatizing or even shaming our patients to the detriment of treatment goals and inevitably patient outcomes. So how is effective communication achieved for sensitive matters? Often a healthcare provider's comments as they open the channels of dialogue with the patient are the most important. A patient's level of comfort in discussing their weight needs to be established. Asking directly if they're okay talking about their general health and weight is the most efficient way to do this. Once the conversation is moving, I've personally found that tactfully choosing terms like excess body weight or above ideal body weight far easier on the ear than excess fat or obese. This practice is very important in establishing trust. One method I've found very useful during this time is not referring to them as the condition. It's common these days to hear that a patient has diabetes rather than is diabetic. This crosses over to has obesity rather than is obese. The next step in maintaining dialogue with the patient is by way of open-ended questions and ensuring we articulate them the way they're intended. This is achieved by first eradicating all implicit assumptions and bias about obesity to ensure that we don't give patients a feeling of being judged. Let me give you an example. The basic questions used by dietitians are based upon three of the main factors that influence a person's weight, their eating, drinking, and exercise patterns, as well as their previous attempts at weight loss. If I say, I think you need to lose weight, this is my opinion, a judgment. Now, consider an alternative like, are you interested in losing some weight? This suggests that you're likely sympathetic to any past attempts, that you're willing to provide them with support across the board, and it allows the patient to begin the conversation without feeling judged or criticized. There are, of course, occasions when consultations don't go as planned, even after your support has been well-established. 
I'm a strong believer, as are many of my colleagues, in relating a patient's weight to their current medical condition, whether it's diabetes, heart disease, osteoarthritis of the knee, or disease of the eye. Regardless of the condition, the general health of the patient is paramount. This is a technique that, when employed with tact, will prove a very persuasive one, as often obesity is considered a separate issue. So, when it's seen as a contributing factor, and therefore one that, if brought under control, may reduce symptoms such as chronic pain, the effort needed to make the change soon appears less significant. Education and ongoing support for the patient will reinforce a healthcare provider's advice and recommendations. This can be as simple as providing patient fact sheets and brochures about their current condition, as well as the benefits of weight management. My personal recommendation is to carefully select two or three measurable, achievable goals and discuss the steps necessary to reach them. This is also a valuable time for the healthcare provider to evaluate the patient's readiness to make the necessary lifestyle changes to lose weight, as well as the extent of familial support, the latter often being a key element of success. All that I've mentioned here today are examples of what dietitians refer to as motivational interviewing. This is an open-ended way of interacting, built around helping patients go from being disinterested in or against a behavior change to taking steps toward being willing to make some changes. It is an open-ended approach to trying to learn where the patient is coming from and what they want and helping them lead the way towards positive behavioral changes. It starts with trying to get the patient to open up about their feelings rather than assuming we know who they are and then together coming up with a set of initial steps they can take. We need to engage the patient, and then the patient activates the behavior change. 